Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the Professor, and this is the Moment of Truth. You know, it's tough going listening to the white media's so-called news programs, which are nothing more than disinformation mills. And it's especially rough going on the weekends, because that's when they give you a concentrated dose of the same swill that they serve up every weekday. I, for one, find it particularly tough to subject myself to the cornucopia of crap that they do on the weekends. But this is one that I've been asked about by a few folks. I think that we can credit Philip Scott, however, with being the one to signal boost this, put it on the map, and actually light it up so people have actually heard about it. Jason Johnson, or as I called him on the few occasions where I could stand to think about the punk Jason Jackass, is saying that the Democrats need to stop focusing on black men, stop focusing on black male voters, and instead focus on Asian and Hispanic voters. But what I always look at when I, when I look at any of these conversations about black folks, I always expand it, right? I always expand it to the, to the rising majority that's in this country. Yes. It ain't going to fall on the shoulders of black people as to whether or not Joe Biden gets elected. The people who are not being discussed enough are the increasingly conservative, young Asian and Latino right. men right. Right. in places like Texas that's and it. Arizona and Colorado. That's, that's going to be the difference. And while everybody sits and has this laser focus on black men, you've got Latino men who are working at the border who are like, hey, I don't like these immigration issues. Why is nobody talking about me? You've got Asian American men who are That's saying, it. hey, wait a minute. I don't think affirmative action has worked for me. We have this twisted focus on the wrong group of people. No matter if every single black person, and, and always, you know, always had 12, 13% of That's black right. people who end up voting for Republican anyway. If every single black man in America who voted for Trump went and voted for Joe Biden this time, it ain't going to change much. I don't think but that's a, true. But a large, I, I'm telling you, even unless you look at a place like Georgia, right, which is a very, very small margin. But most of those black men, it's it's not going to end up making a difference. But if we look at Latino men and we look at Asian men, that's where the difference is. That's where the focus needs to be. We have to, the Democrats have to have, yes, the Democrats yeah. have to have a pivot to different kinds of people and stop talking to folks who are 55, 60 years old who listen to what an old rapper has to say because their votes are already decided. It's those 18, 19 year olds who are working right now at CVS and Verizon who don't see a difference, who are the ones who are yeah. liable to either stay home or switch their vote. Now, the internet going to be on fire by what you just said about black men, Jason. I just want to uh, get you <laughs> Is ready. This is what passes for a black man in the white media. He's sitting here openly telling everybody, you don't need to focus on black men. And when he's saying black men, he means black people. But he's using the words black men as a euphemism for the black community. You don't need to listen to what some rapper has to say because that group has already made up their minds. Oh, don't be listening to those black folks who are like in their 50s. He's talking about Gen Xers, what he means. I guess Jason Johnson still butthurt about the fact that that rapper, Killer Mike, has far more influence with black voters than the shill mouthpiece Jason Johnson has ever had. Jason Johnson is part of the bootlick class. As he sees it, he's the smartest Negro in the room, or at least that's what his white paymasters at MSNBC tell him. So he simply can't understand why any black people would sooner listen to a rapper before they listen to him. Now, earlier, though, in this propaganda panel, Johnson and Simone Sanders both pointed out that Trump and the GOP's share of black voters hasn't changed over the last eight years and that this election will be decided by black voters, or at least that's what they were intimating. I, I don't think my personal philosophy on this, my intellectual philosophy on this, it ain't about switching votes. Okay, Donald Trump, Killer Mike, any of his surrogates, any rapper that he got out of jail. Home? Yes, it's about keeping people home. It's about saying, Joe Biden is terrible. I'm terrible. Your life hasn't yeah. changed yes, much. It is Don't voter get depression. involved. Yes, yeah. he ain't trying it to is, switch anybody over. He's yes. trying to get you to stay home. It is a voter depression tactic. In 2016, he won 8% of black voters across the country. In 2020, again, about 8% of black voters. The last election, he got about 8, I do believe, 9% of black voters. To the point that Garrett made at the top of the show, if it's the margins that matter here because this is going to be a close it's election. So yeah. And if Donald Trump is able to, instead of getting 8%, maybe he ticks up to 12 or 13 or uh, that and the depression of some black votes is enough for people to stay home. And true to the white media, Simone Sanders comes in with the lecturing and the finger wagging, just like Tiffany Cross before her. She tried to laud all the list of things that Biden had allegedly done for black voters, but all she could name was one lousy thing, money for HBCUs. And that was it. I have black men in my life that voted for Donald Trump in 2016. 
Okay. My husband is not one of them because I know people, my husband from South Carolina. My husband is not one of them. I just want to be clear. My man is not one of them. But in 2016, I, I know black people that voted for Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And so I am not shocked nor surprised. But what I do encourage people to do is do their research. It is not true that Donald Trump had the lowest unemployment rate ever for black people. That happened under Joe Biden in April of yeah, 2023. Right yeah. You know, it's not true that he has you know done the most for HBCUs like that happened under Joe Biden and this administration. Like it's look, do your research folks just give a give a quick google search she ran out of things to say after that one talking point so even she can't name anything that biden's actually done for black voters but this mushmouth moron had the nerve to say do your research do your research we have mammy sanders that's what the black media is for that's how we know what Biden's done and what he hasn't done. And we don't take your word for anything because you're a known liar. Remember, when Biden was running for president in 2020, it was Simone Sanders who, when confronted about Biden's 94 crime bill and the mass incarceration of black people that followed, she tried to lie and say, well, that was the states, you see. That was the states. See, four years ago when she actually got called out on it, she was saying that Biden didn't have anything to do with that. That wasn't federal. That was states. It was the states locking up all those black people. Apparently, she wasn't actually expecting CNN to accidentally do their job and actually call her out on her lies. We heard from Senator uh, Harris uh, in that uh, piece from Arlette about uh, her refuting a claim that the vice president made this week that the 1994 crime bill that he wrote did not um, contribute to mass incarceration. I want you to listen to former President Bill Clinton. This is uh, President Clinton, who signed that into law in 2015. I signed a bill that made the problem worse. And I want to admit it. In that bill, there were longer sentences. And most of these people are in prison under state law, but the federal law set a trend. And that was overdone. We were wrong about that. President Clinton says that that they were wrong about that. Senator Harris has said that it contributed to mass incarceration. Why is it uh, Vice President Biden admitting what we're hearing from the former president? Well, look, I think what we can go back to Vice President Biden's comments at the National Action Network breakfast in January, where he noted um, that the, the, the crime bill, by way of this disparity between crack and powder cocaine, trapped an entire generation of people. Look, I think many people will tell you across the country, Victor, black folks included, um, that, the, that the crime bill and the reaction to what was happening in the early 90s. Now, look, I wasn't I was only about three or four, but I'm a student of history. What was happening in the early 90s, um, the reaction was was an overcorrection to a very real issue. But we are going to see some policy rollouts from um, our campaign very soon, Victor. I know folks have questions so, about so, uh, what uh, is Vice President Biden's criminal justice is, policy. Is it, is it now the, the, those are going to come. Now but I mean, the, campaign's pol- the campaign's position that the crime bill did contribute to mass incarceration? <laughs> Victor, I think the vice with the vice, the vice president, uh, his comments speak for themselves. What is very well, clear his, is but his this, comment that was that it does not contribute to mass incarceration. The former president who signed his, it said and, it and did. If we, and if, look, Victor, if we play the whole clip, what he also said was, his comment was, what he also said was, that the majority of folks that are incarcerated were incarcerated at the state level. And there's and a that reason for that. Let me put up, let me put up the truth and sentencing and incentives and there, here. And I mean, there is a reason but for that. But there's a reason. Let me put it up. Let I mean, me put, just, put it up on the screen, guys, the truth and sentencing section of the 1994 crime bill. This is page 21. It incentivized... Uh, It offered billions of dollars to build new uh, correctional facilities if states would increase the percentage of convicted violent offenders, increase the average prison time, increase the percentage of the sentence was there. Did this bill not incentivize putting more people in jail and keeping them there longer? uh, Victor. I no, I am not going to sit here and tell you the crime bill was perfect. There was some, there was some really great preventative things that it did. It took on the NRA, NRA, and then there was an overcorrection. What you're describing was an overcorrection. There was a reach. Some folks went too far. The bill wasn't perfect. Republicans fought to put a lot of things in that bill. Democrats fought, Democrats fought to get a lot of things out of the bill. But at the end of the day, Victor, at the end of the day, no one is suggesting that what has happened, what has ravaged communities um, over the last 27 yeah. years, uh, does not need to be fixed. No one is suggesting that there is not a real issue. There's not a real problem or a real right. issue. And I'm here to tell you that Vice President Biden will have roll out. You'll see a criminal justice policy soon. We are going to continue to have to have this conversation about the crime bill. Um, 
all, all right. throughout the campaign trail. But we're also going to put forward some policies, Victor. So just well, wait and see. Give us a minute. Wait we, and see. We will look forward to those. Simone Sanders, thanks so much. Soon as Victor Blackwell pulled the receipt, Simone Sanders immediately said, well, well, it's not perfect. Oh, yeah, so she knew all about it. She just didn't know she was going to get called on it. The 94 crime bill had more than just a bunch of racially colored laws in it. It also had billions of dollars offered to the states to get them to change their own state legislation. That's what happened. Joe Biden used the power of the purse, which only Congress has. Congress alone has the ability to print money. And that being the case, he waved a check under the noses of those states and told them, go ahead and change your laws so we can go after these niggers at the local, state, and federal level. Let's go ahead and declare war on black people, and we'll go ahead and do it through weaponizing the laws. And it worked. But of course, Simone Sanders acting like she didn't know anything about it. And when she got called on it, the best she could do was say, well, uh, uh, the, the, the um, 94 crime bill wasn't perfect. No, it actually was perfect. It was meant to go after black people to specifically racially target us, and it did that. Those laws worked exactly the way that they were designed to. You see, we also remember, though, how Joe Biden made a bunch of phony promises four years ago. He promised a lift every voice plan, whatever the hell that was. But after he won the presidency, he never mentioned it again. He promised a White House-level police accountability commission. But as soon as he was announced the winner of the 2020 election, he immediately said that he changed his mind because he suddenly realized... He just didn't have time for a White House-level police accountability commission. He only realized that after he won the presidency. He also promised a George Floyd Policing Act. He promised a John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Whatever became of any of that. Now, sure, most of these empty gestures weren't even substantive, but they were specifically promises that he made to black voters in exchange for our votes. But even these empty do-nothing gestures were simply too much for Biden to do. He only proposed these gestures because he could see black voters were going to stay home in 2020, just like we had in 2016. He had to pretend to be serious about policies meant for us. So black voters gave him a chance, and no sooner than they called the results in his favor, Biden was already backtracking on all of it. He hadn't even taken office yet, and he was already saying he wasn't going to do any of the stuff he promised. He was determined not to set a precedent where black people are actually going to get something for their vote. That's what this was about. So we have done our homework, Mammy Sanders. You're the one who needs to do your research. Or rather, you need to stop ignoring the information that you know to be true. The B-1 has more receipts than a CPA. We know Biden's record when it comes to not doing anything for black voters, and you know it too. And if you think talking about the HBCUs is going to impress us, it won't. There was a time when the HBCUs actually used to be about something. They used to be genuine, authentic cathedrals of learning. But now they've devolved into nothing more than party schools, pseudo-academic whorehouses that produce trash like Roly Poly Martin, Kamala Harris, and Simone Sanders. But getting back to Jackass Johnson, you notice how when he was taking aim at voters, he was not talking about black baby boomers. The baby boomers are dying out, which means that they are a decreasing share of the voters. And Gen X is in their 50s and 40s, as are many millennials. They're entering their 40s. So this is who Jason Johnson is targeting and saying this is who should be ignored. Because the Gen Xers and the millennials and increasingly Gen Z are the ones making demands, putting pressure on these Democrats for changes that will overturn the racial hierarchy. And they're sending out their black bootlick contingent who they pay to say, don't listen to black people. They're irrelevant. Just focus on everyone else. And this little scumbag said that from his chest. Oh, he was bold about it. He was bold. He was absolutely bad. Look how big his bug eyes became talking about ignoring black voters. Jason Johnson is a self-hating sellout. But then again, as we've informed you in the past here in the black media, it runs in Jason Johnson's family. Of course he's an agent. His mother is a certified agent. She's worked with the police and even the feds. So treason runs in his family. It's in their blood. He's a smiling, tap-dancing, bootlicking sellout. This is why the white media puts this idiot on, because he's a certified self-hating clown. Have you ever seen Andrew Yang or any Hispanic politician or commentator saying that Democrats need to focus on black voters? They don't say that at all. Jason Johnson is himself supposed to be a black man, albeit a lousy excuse for one. He's on air literally campaigning against himself, saying, oh, we don't need to be focusing on no black men. Don't, don't worry about black men. Their minds are already made up. It's all about these Asian voters now. It's about these Hispanic voters now. I need to be thinking about that instead. Now, why is he so enthused and so passionate and so bold about saying that the Democrats need to ignore voters who look like him? This has never happened before, ever. Look, these so-called news shows are scripted as hell. The people you see on these panels, they get notes on what to say. You can see them looking down at the notes in front of them while they're talking. So they're not giving an opinion on anything because they don't have an opinion. 
They have talking points given to them by the producers of these shows, and they read it on air and try not to sound too much like it's coming off a teleprompter or was handed to them an hour before they went on air. And don't kid yourself. This was not some sort of coincidence that they went from saying Trump's trying to depress the black vote to then immediately saying black men's votes are irrelevant. And Jason Johnson's pivot was so clumsy, so awkward, it was excruciatingly obvious what he was doing and why. Talk about the wrong tool for the wrong job. You would never see Joe Biden saying to ignore white male voters. Dang sure wouldn't see Trump saying that. You wouldn't have Chuck Schumer saying it either. You would not have them saying to ignore white voters of any description. And you would never see Rashida Tlaib or Mehdi Hassan or Andrew Yang or any other non-white media figure or politician saying that if Biden loses, the blame can't fall squarely on the shoulders of their ethnic group or their constituency. They would be saying exactly the opposite. They would say, Biden ignored us and you lost the election. Now you got to give in to our demands. They would be playing on that. Of course, it's not true. Outside of a few towns in California and Washington state, the Asian vote is not decisive to any elections, not even at the statewide level in most of America. And the same goes for Hispanics, a few places in Texas and California, maybe Florida. But outside of that, no. Only the black vote is competitive nationwide. And Asian and Hispanics tend to trend for Republicans. So why ignore the very constituency who is the most consistent to vote for the Democrats and instead waste time and effort for constituencies who don't vote Democrat and are not inclined to? Why do that? It would be far easier and faster to focus on the black vote, the ones who put Biden in office, and to try to drive up black voter turnout. It's a no-brainer. So why is Jason Johnson telling Democrats to ignore a sure thing and go chase political red herrings? Because of the black voters, specifically those 35-year-olds to the early 50-somethings who are talking about reparations. See, with those other groups, white supremacy can play along with their demands, even though it won't help them get into office or stay there, because these other groups' demands don't threaten white supremacy. Their demands don't threaten the racial hierarchy. So it costs the Democrats nothing to do things for groups who didn't vote for them, so long as they're not black. The problem isn't black voters staying home. It's that black voters have now made it a point to attach our vote to a specific political demand, one that benefits us. Have you ever seen any feminist Democrat activist say to ignore white women because they've already made up their minds, even though they have? No, for every other group, it's all about how do Democrats appeal to them. Doesn't matter their voting habits. This is the first time you've ever seen some empty-headed Democrat pundit saying to openly ignore black voters, but it won't be the last time you see it. I've been telling you for years, this has been the Democrats' plan all along. For the Democrats to reach out to non-black voters, to immigrants, casual, racist, read white moderates, anyone but black voters. Because as we've coalesced around tangibles specifically for ourselves, we have now become the biggest threat to the Democrats. Because we're making demands that will require power to change hands. The Democrats are controlled opposition. Always have been. Their job is not to defeat Republicans because they both work for the same wealthy white paymasters. The Democrats' job is to get you and me to sit on our hands while they tell us how they're going to do things for us, all the while they turn right around and do absolutely nothing. This is why I remind you of all the lies and broken promises that Biden has made, and he's not the only one. But notice how nobody's talking about how he didn't fulfill all of those lofty promises that he made years ago. They never point that out. They act as if, oh, he did all these great things, knowing dang well they're lying. You can tell the DNC put those words in Jason Johnson's mouth to say, just like Simone Sanders. Simone Sanders has worked for not one, but two Democratic presidential candidates. And she worked in the Biden White House. So what the hell do you expect her to say? And Jason Johnson, that dude's been licking the DNC's boots and other areas so long, I'll bet you his tongue needs toilet paper at this point. They use front Negroes like Johnson to be the first ones to make these attacks on the black community. And then afterwards, after the ice is broken... They send in the white racists on the left to continue the attack and really go in on us. We saw this with the whole woke thing. Obama was actually the first major figure to attack wokeness. And then right afterwards, you had nigga Jim Clyburn attacking calls to defund the police. Stop sloganizing! Stop sloganizing! And then the Cajun Skeletor, James Carville, pulled up the rear, attacking wokeness and defunding the police, etc. They only made sure to attack things that black people were demanding. Only the things that black people were advocating, which is exactly what the Republicans do, like Ron DeSantis and others. If it's something that black people are advocating for or something pertaining to black people, that's what they attack. And everybody understands exactly why they're doing it. This is the purpose that these black shills like Jason Johnson and Simone Sanders serve for white supremacy. They're the ones who white power sends out first to push some line of anti-black policy, and then they send in the white figures after them to really go in on us. That's how it always works. That's the pattern. 
This is what I and others in the black media have been telling you was going to happen. That the white media would start a barrage of phony stories and propaganda, all of it to say that if Biden loses, it's because of these other non-black groups they weren't being catered to. Oh, what about the Arab vote? Well, it doesn't matter that there's not enough of them to actually turn the election. The point is, if Biden loses, it's going to be because of them. And that's what the white media is doing right now. They're talking about Michigan and saying that whole non-committal thing that Rashida Tlaib was saying to vote for. They're talking about that. And now we got Jason Johnson saying, well, it's going to be about the Asians and the Hispanics. So if Biden wins, they'll be able to pivot and say that, well, it was because these other groups came to Biden's rescue. If he loses, it's because he displeased these other groups. But it's all about, well, we can't talk about black people anymore. We got to find a way to just say that black people are irrelevant to the election cycles now. And they did this right after they just got through saying that black votes were the ones that Donald Trump was trying to suppress. That Donald Trump wants black voters to be apathetic or stay home or what have you. They're sitting here talking out of both sides of their mouths. But then again, white supremacy believes in taking both sides of the conversation. Thank you very much, Neely Fuller. Now, you see what Andrew Yang did in 2020, he tried to claim that it was Asian voters who handed Georgia to the Democrats. That's a lie. Black voters in Atlanta were the ones who handed the Democrats the presidency through Georgia and also control of the Senate through Georgia. And in Michigan, nobody cares what Rashida Tlaib has to say outside of Dearborn. The Arab vote is politically irrelevant outside of Dearborn. Sure, Rashida Tlaib can run her mouth a lot and get some white media attention, but even Mehdi Hassan, as I pointed out in the Sunday address, he talked with Democrat strategists and campaign aides for Biden, and they told him that they think they can win Michigan even without Arab voters. Go back and watch the Sunday address. Watch Mehdi Hassan say those words, and you'll notice that afterwards, he didn't even attempt to say that, well, actually, you can't win without the Arab vote. He didn't say anything at all. So Jason Johnson is firing what's supposed to be the first salvo of an anti-black propaganda carpet bombing campaign. What he's saying is what I've been telling you the Democrats have been trying to do for years now, to cobble together some Frankenstein monster of a voting constituency comprised solely of non-black voters. This is not about reaching out to more voters. This is about trying to make the black vote as irrelevant as possible, to neutralize the threat that all of these black voters' demands are posing. This is about maintaining the status quo. Now that a critical mass of black voters are on code for tangibles, the Democrats are panicking. And I've been telling you this has been coming for a while now, and here they are doing it, and you see the clowns who they're trotting out to sell the soap. And don't let his singling out black men fool you, by the way, for the Shea Butter Twitter crowd. The reason that he said black men is because black men have been the driving force behind this political sea change in the black community. But this is him trying to do his low-key, lame brain idea of gender war and going to drive that gender divide. He knows that a large and growing number of black women are already on code and more joining us every day. Jason Johnson thinks he's being slick by attacking the bearers of the message as opposed to the ones who have actually taken up the message. And if that's still not good enough for you, you notice how Jason Johnson didn't say a word about black women while he was busy saying that the black male vote was irrelevant and didn't matter. He didn't say anything about black female voters, now did he? If black men are the ones who need to be ignored, why didn't he spare even a word about the political power of black women or about what the Democrats need to be doing for black women? Need to be reaching out to black women. He didn't say that at all because his DNC paymasters gave him the talking points. And it's fully understood that when he says black men, that's nothing more than a clumsy euphemism for black people. I mean, the damned insult that these scumbags would try this. You have a table full of morons who are hearing somebody say that half of black voters should be ignored and none of them points out that that's political suicide. The closest thing to push back that you had was Mammy Sanders giving a lone pathetic, I don't think so. And then after that, saying, oh, you're going to be lit up on the internet. Jason Johnson's so freaking desperate for somebody to pay attention to him. He'll say anything. I expect for him next to slather himself in peanut butter and jump off the Eiffel Tower if he thought that it would get some clicks. He'll get attention, but not the way he would have liked. But this is supposed to be what counts as some sort of conscientious and objective commentary. Give me a break. That's because MSNBC is actually MSDNC. This is, of course, not news to anyone. Of course, MSNBC is the official broadcast mouthpiece for the Democratic Party leadership, just like Fox News is the official mouthpiece for the Republican Party leadership. The reason Jason Johnson's saying this nonsense and nobody pushed back on it is because this is their message to push this line. Their job is to get their talking points and read from the script. And our job is to ignore the noise and stay on code. Jason Johnson can slam his gums, but he's been wrong on all of his predictions. Nobody listens to this clown. Of course, the congressional black talkers are MIA on this one. 
They need to be cornered on this, too. You have MSNBC openly saying to ignore black voters. Does the congressional black talkers care? Of course they don't. Hell, give them a chance and they'll agree with it. This is what those civil rights retreads like the NAACP, the Urban League, and the National Inaction Network and others have been trying to pivot to. All of these would-be civil rights groups trying to expand their wannabe audience of members so that they can get more donations. They've all been trying to be as colorblind as possible. Oh, we gotta get beyond the black community. We gotta say black and brown, or black and yellow, or black and LGBT, or black and immigrant. We gotta make sure that we shoehorn everybody else into the conversation, even though nobody so much as mentions us in theirs. So understand that. This sudden obsession the white media has with Arab voters' opinion and with saying, look at these other groups over here, that's not because there's been some huge political shift. There hasn't. It's because black voters are making their voices heard, and it's a problem. They know that more and more black voters, especially younger black voters, are getting comfortable with the idea of weaponizing our vote and putting the arm on the Democrats, no matter how uncomfortable it is for them. They know that we're doing it for the sake of leveraging tangibles for ourselves. We are making it where the only way you're going to get the black vote is to destroy white power. You have to destroy anti-black racism to get our vote. They can't afford for the idea of black tangibles being the issue for our people to take hold. They can't afford that. They can't afford for people to already be conditioned that when you come to the black community, you cannot come with your hand out. You got to be showing up with what you're going to give the black community. They don't want that to become the norm. We put the bastards' backs to the wall. They know that it's the black vote that decides the elections. Hell, James Carville himself admitted it not so long ago. Ah, but you notice they haven't led him on the air to say that anymore. Notice that? I showed you the videos of James Carville saying that the black vote has been declining for the Democrats for at least a decade now, and certainly the last couple of election cycles. Yeah, but now we notice in the last few months, you can't find James Carville saying that. They don't want that out there. It's like, oh, James Carville, you're saying too much, you're saying too much. We're trying to pivot now. We're trying to put this new message out there. Carville was right. That's a rare thing. But they know it. And they also know that the black demands aren't going away. No matter what the Jason Johnsons and Simone Mammy Sanders say, these bootlicks have no credibility. They have no influence. And that eats Jason Johnson alive. I, I, I've got this show on MSNBC. I get to pretend like I'm important, at least for an hour or so on the weekends. But everybody looks at me and says that I'm just an irrelevant sellout. I don't get it. They see which way the black vote's heading, and they're trying to get out in front of it. That's what the white media is trying to do. They see where this is going. So they're trying to get ahead of it. Lay the groundwork for a lie that the black vote didn't decide any elections, so you shouldn't do what black voters say. Oh, I know, I know. It looks like the black vote were the ones who handed the election to Trump, just like in 2016. I, I, we know it looks that way, but in reality, it was actually the Arab vote. It was the Asian vote. It was the Hispanic vote. It was the union votes. It was white women. It was LGBT. It was aliens from Mars, one-eyed, one-horned, blind, purple people eaters. It wasn't the black community. And we have two bought and paid for bootlicks, these two sellouts, pushing this lie. For those of you who are new here or who aren't realistic about the situation we're in, there's a reason why we don't have anything to do with these Negroes you see in the white media. They are the enemies of the black community. Here they are. And these are the main fools who say that we need to vote for Biden and we need to back the Democrats. They've even worked for the Democrats, and here they are saying that the Democrats need to ignore us. So this is what they're demanding we vote for. This is what some of these mushy brain morons lecture you and me about. And they say that if you don't vote for Biden, then you ain't black. Or they tell us, oh, no, no, you definitely cannot be voting for Trump, and you can't stay home either. You doing that? Why? You're just handing the presidency over to Trump. You're handing America over to fascism. No, Biden did that. And these are the idiots who they tell you and me constitutes the lesser of two evils. This is supposed to be a choice for us. A choice between a racist old orange man who insults us and says he's not going to do anything for us. Or a racist pale old man who's going to act like we don't even exist. They couldn't be more blatant with the disrespect and the contempt. No matter what Jason Johnson tries to say, all of the white noise he throws out will not be able to drown out the black truth. They're going to learn that when it comes to ignoring people who refuse to say what you want to hear, black people can play that game too. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Wally Belisle, Mark Singleton, Bomber777, Jacques Hargette, and Earl Gates. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.